So Newton's initial work on optics is absolutely dominated by the most conventional sources that people of his generation are reading. The work of Descartes, uh, above all, uh, which he started reading in 1664 when he was 21, um, and of the Aristotelian tradition, which he was um, already a master of, and of new work which begins to appear in the early 1660s through 1664 and 1665, notably the writings of Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke. Um, the fundamental problem that Newton found in what he was reading comes from a great Aristotelian principle, which is that there are two kinds of colours in the world, real and imaginary. Real colours are the colours that are intrinsic to bodies, so the colours of cloth, the colours of paint, um, those are real, they inhere in the uh, bodies themselves. And then there are what were called imaginary colours, which don't inhere in bodies but are made by the movement and effects and changes of light. And the most obvious example of that is the rainbow. So. Um, there isn't really, the Aristotelians would say, colour in the heavens uh, when we look at a rainbow. Those colours are made by the movement of light through different media. And there's a domestic, terrestrial way of making artificial rainbows, which is the glass prism, the crystal prism, which can make rainbows uh, at will. What Descartes argued very influentially uh, from the 1630s onwards, and then this is very much what Newton had read in Descartes' principles, was that there's only one kind of colour, and all colours are imaginary. There are no real colours in the world. All colours are made by the movement of particles of light and their changes of speed, and the impression that we have of colour is therefore some strange relationship between what happens in the mind, above all the part of the mind where we sense, the sensorium, and real motions of bodies in the world. So that was the problem situation that Newton faced. Um, are there two kinds of colours, real and imaginary, or but one kind of colour? If there's only one kind of colour and it's imaginary, that means that all colours are made the way colours are when we shine light through a prism. So that began to give the crystal prism a privileged role in the investigation of colour. In 1664 and 1665, um, Newton began to do a series of experiments which are recorded in his undergraduate notebook in which he looked at objects through prisms. And what he found, um, not entirely unexpectedly, given what he'd been reading, was that different coloured images seem to move differently as they pass through a prism. So he makes, for example, cards with a strip of blue and a strip of red. You look at the two strips through a prism and they split. And that implies that the angle at which the light from the blue card is um, moving is different when it's refracted through a prism from the angle made by the light particles streaming out from the red part of the card. Newton more or less adopted Descartes' idea initially that these differences in colour are due to differences in the behaviour of light particles. What Newton initially supposes is that um, essentially the rays that make blue in our sensorium are travelling more slowly than the rays that make red. So the pressure that a red making ray exerts on our eye is larger than the pressure that a blue making ray exerts on our eye. And this led to some of his initial most heroic, if not suicidal, um, experiments in which he would take a brass plate or eventually a wooden needle, a wooden bodkin, and press it between the bone and the eyeball 
in order to vary the pressures on the eyeball. And what he seemed to find was that the larger the pressure, the redder the image. So this confirmed him in his view that red-making rays travel faster and exert more pressure. They hit more strongly than do blue. So there's a physiological underpinning for Newton's initial interest in optics. And that interest then developed in two very closely related ways. One was to investigate the role that what he called the will, so the, the action of the soul, had on what we seem to see in the world. And the other was to make sense of this difference between different colour-making rays. And those are very closely related themes. So first of all, the question of the will. Newton had read very closely the work of his Cambridge colleague, Henry Moore, at Christ's College, a pious, Anglican, divine philosopher and poet, who in the 1650s wrote a series of works defending orthodox natural philosophy using the principles of Platonism against what Moore saw as the threats of mechanical atheism. And Moore's main opponent in these works was the greatest of all English mechanical philosophers, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, Newton certainly also read Hobbes' writings on body and on the principles of philosophy. And what was at stake there is can everything that we see in the world be entirely explained by the movement of matter alone? Is there any evidence in the world of an independent entity, the soul, the spirit? For orthodox religion, there must be, and Hobbes seemed to have denied that, hence Hobbes's reputation as an atheist. So what Newton does is to essentially design a series of experiments to see if that's true. Uh, these involve um, staring at bright lights and, above all, at the sun for some time. And then in a dark room, examining what we now call phosphenes, the after images that are left in the sensorium after you've stared at a bright light. And to examine whether it's possible by will alone, by memory, to bring back this sense data. If one could do that, then it seemed that you could say, no, the cause of what we see in the world is not just mechanical. It must also at least depend on the will, the mind, the soul, and something spiritual. And indeed, what almost literally struck Newton in these experiments, especially the experiments he did on his own eyes, either with pressure or by staring at the sun, was that the kinds of images that you could make by will, using your soul, um, were coloured images. And they were images that strongly resemble the rainbow. They are images with rings of colours in the order of the kind of images you see when light is refracted through a crystal or a glass. So that immediately, from 1665 onwards, draws his attention towards more and more sophisticated experiments in optics and, above all, the propagation of light and colour. So the most famous of these experiments, which must have been performed sometime in 1665, is an experiment using a prism and sunlight. Essentially, what Newton was doing in this experiment was to build an artificial eye and then stand inside it. What he knew from the 17th century tradition, going back to Kepler, if not before, was that the way our eyes work is the way a camera works. A camera, in this period, means a room, literally. A room which is cast into darkness and then drill a bright hole in a window of the room so that a light beam can enter the room and it will cast an image on one of the walls of the room. That, according to Kepler, is how the eye works, a pinhole camera. 
Um, and um, what Newton does is to build a pinhole camera the size of his own room, so some 20 or 25 feet in length, which he darkens by closing the shutters and drills a hole. And then at the pinhole, he puts a prism so as to cast the image of the sun, which streams in through the hole, onto the distant wall and to examine the image that's cast. So rather than do an experiment on his own eye, he's essentially built an artificial eye large enough to do experiments inside it. And he sets up this projection experiment in a very deliberate way. Um, the way he records the experiment is very striking in this regard because it's important for him to represent what he's going to see as a surprise even though it's all rather deliberately engineered. He sets the prism at the hole at a position where the sunlight streaming into the triangular prism enters at the same angle as it leaves. And under those circumstances, you would, according to Keplerian and Cartesian optics, expect an image exactly the same uh, shape as the image of the hole. If the hole is circular, you'd expect an image on the wall that was a circle. And that is what you do not see, says Newton. Instead, the hole is spread out into some kind of oval, and on the oval are coloured striations, from red through orange, yellow and green, to blue and violet. And Newton invents a word to describe that image, and the word is spectrum, which comes from the Latin for ghost. So this is clearly a kind of spiritual exercise, as well as a material experiment. And what Newton takes this experiment reasonably enough to show is that different colour-making rays bend at different angles through glass. That for each different colour-making ray, there is what he's going to call a refrangibility, which is different. And what that will allow him to do is to apply mathematics to colour. Because he'll be able to correlate an angle whose size can be measured with a colour in the spectrum. And he begins to move away from his early conjecture that different colours are made by particles travelling at different speeds towards um, a more quantitative model in which different colours are, in a certain sense, measured by their refrangibility. And within a few months, he's developed a rich repertoire of experiments which are recorded in his notebooks which include demonstrations that colors don't that primitive colors true primitive red or true primitive blue don't change color when subjected to a second refraction and what he deduces from that again reasonably enough is that white light is not simple but compound that it's a compound of seven primitive, different colour-making rays. And he's already in that position by 1665, 1666. He's now moved far away from orthodoxy, either Aristotelian orthodoxy or the views of Descartes, um, or indeed many of the views that he would have read from English writers of the period, like Boyle and Hooke. This is really a quite subversive and almost heretical idea. Because finally, remember where Newton begins. Newton begins with the thought, all colours are imaginary, no colours are real. And he ends up, by the middle of the 1660s, with the claim that there are seven different coloured making rays, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet, that they can be mathematically distinguished and that white light is a compound. And that's a view which many will find difficult to accept. 